The content of this on-demand presentation is a production of SilverTech. Intensely interactive, intelligently integrated. Your full-service digital marketing strategists. Online at www.silvertech.com. This is Search Engine Insights, the Relevancy Edition. I'm Mark Frechette. In this on-demand presentation, we'll be discussing search engine optimization as the art of proving your website's value to the search engines that are so valuable to your website. We'll be discussing keyword use, URL structure, inbound links, user location, and the other on- and off-page search engine signals that are so important to your ranking. We'll discuss a few services, a few tips of the trade, and the best and worst practices for your online brand. And while this is an on-demand presentation, we'll also be answering your questions through Magic and Twitter at SilverTech and Facebook at Facebook.com slash SilverTech. Before we start discussing what works in search engine optimization, I'd like to discuss a little bit about why it works. Search engines like Google and Bing, their product is a relevant search match, meaning if a user types in pizza... They'll find the first three, four, five hundred results highly relevant to what they were looking for. Pages and websites about pizza. Now, for Google to say and for Bing to say that this is a relevant search result and for the user to agree, really these search engines have to look at the website and grade the website like a person. As such, search engines over time have become less this robotic looking into the depths of your source code and really more taking your page and your website for the most part at face value. With that, there's a few on-site search optimization mantras that aren't likely to get outdated soon. So while tricks and tips may come and go, these three sayings are here to say. The first, if it works on a person, it probably works on a search engine. If a person can't see it, search engines likely don't care about it. And if a person thinks it's horseradish, search engines will likely agree. The first rule of on-site search engine optimization is if it works on a person, it probably works on a search engine. Think about your website's content as a human rather than a robot. It's way easier. Looking through the copy of your website, do you have the keywords and content that would tell a person what your brand is all about, what this website and what this particular page is about? The formatting also helps. Looking at your page for the first time, are the right keywords in bold? Is the most important information in the right size? Are there headers for crying out loud? Images and diagrams can be a little tricky because, and we'll see this in a few slides, Google and Bing can't actually see your images, but they can see how you describe them. The title of your web page is the cover of your book. Not only is it going to help search engines figure it out, but it's going to help people who are seeing this title in their search engine results pages know that this is what they're looking for. The file name or the URL or the link is one of the most important things that you have control over and one of the most often overlooked. MySite.com slash home does nothing for you unless you want to sell a home. Internal links are also very important. This is when you have content of once part of your web page driving somebody to another part of your website where there can be more information. Now, in a book, we might see this and you'd see it as see figure 2-1-3 and that tells the user nothing. Well, it tells nobody nothing. And online, because of your hyperlinks, you can be a little more descriptive and you should be descriptive and include the keywords you want and click here for more is never a keyword that any business wants to rank higher on. But let's take a look at an example and really see this stuff working. Take a moment to figure out what this website and what this web page on this website is about. The title is Ski and H, Lift Ticket Deals at New Hampshire Ski Areas, and the URL is in the bottom right-hand corner. It's skianh.com slash deals. And on the Ski and H website, we see that the header for this particular page is deals. And while I can't expect you to read the content in your little video window, all that content is talking about ways to save money and deals on New Hampshire ski vacations, including like cheaper lift tickets and stuff like that. So as user, can you figure out what this page is about? Okay, we probably can. And admittedly, I gave you enough hints that you can really get it. But what about Google? A search engine doesn't see your page like this. 
is search engines, when they're crawling your site, will see your page more like this. The emphasis is on the content, and the emphasis is on the link, and the emphasis is on those kind of more technical details like a good title and a great URL. Here our title is still Ski NH Lift Ticket Deals at New Hampshire Ski Areas, and right away a search engine can kind of look at that and say, oh, I know what this page is about. And it's still seeing that great header of deals. And right away, a search engine would go, ah, and the links and all these other things and the content and all these other things are very apparent to search engines looking at this page and they say, ah, if you're looking for a ski deal in New Hampshire, this might be a relevant page. Now, in truth, it's a little more like this. This is what I call a, this is a more of a hybrid view. And what it's doing is it's showing us the view we would have laid on top of the view a search engine would have with the emphasis on those little highlighted boxy areas. I said earlier that search engines cannot see your pictures, and that's true. Um, but they can see your website and your images in a way that, uh, in the same way that a person with special accessibility concerns would. The alt tag was developed for those who are visually impaired so that they wouldn't miss out on the visual elements that were important to the content of a web page. Search engines also reference this because it's what they have available to them. Using descriptive alt tags on the important images helps your images matter as part of your content. So you don't lose that great content as a ranking factor for your page. We also see um, in the wide highlighted area that this deals header is an H1 tag. Now, get a little get get a little geeky here. Is that search engines don't really care if you use an actual header tag. It's really okay, just like a person, to have the content be just larger text. But when it's a header tag, that's kind of the best practice for saying. Well, basically for declaring the content for that page like you would a header. This is how the site actually performs in an organic search result. So doing a search for New Hampshire ski deals and do the same search. Let me know if it comes up the same in your neck of the woods. We see that it comes up, the page comes up in the first slot and the website comes up in the second slot for New Hampshire ski deals. Meanwhile, those first three results are paid results and they're paying an arm and a leg to be there for each click. Uh, whereas Ski and H is just there naturally and enjoying uh, the click-through of first page results. On Bing, we're seeing a similar story. Again, we're getting the first two results, and this is actually a little more rare than you'd think because what works on Google, their formula is completely different than what works on Bing. And so when we look at search engine as a ser optimization as a series of tricks, we might try something that'll help us rank better in Google while hurting our chances in Bing. But when we use the rule of thumb of if it works on a person, it probably works on a search engine, stay strictly white hat, which means doing the right things with the right intentions, we're likely to rank as high in Google as we are in Bing without any sneaky tricks. Now, if you've ever taken a search engine optimization class before, or you're just well experienced in it, this shouldn't be a whole lot of surprise to you. But I want to take, for those of you who are a little bit newer to this, I want to go through a few of the best practices just real quick. First was the use of a very descriptive title tag. Now, uh, the rule of thumb is you want to leave the title of your website, in this case, Ski and H, to the back. For example, the brand name Silvertech uh, on our website is further down in the title tags because Silvertech itself is not something we're really looking to rank highly in and not something we need the help with. So we use words, keywords that we want to rank higher in earlier on in the title tag. Now, in the case of Ski and H, it obviously made a lot more sense to put that brand name in the front. Because we want to rank for content about deals, but within the context of, within the context of New Hampshire skiing. We also made sure that the content here is really on point. It is about deals. It's all about deals. It doesn't really stray from deals. And if it did have to stray from deals, that's section, that's content that can be used somewhere else. This content's also unique to this particular section of the website. So there's no conflict going from one page to the other, no confusion for a user or for the search engines trying to figure out what your site is about and where the important sections of your site are.
Also take a look at the internal links. They're not click here for online ticket deals. It's daily ticket deals is the link and that's it. We're not trying to rank higher for click here. Also remember that the images where you alt tags were used were appropriate. And the URL structure of slash deals seems pretty obvious. And that's why it works. Your second on-site search engine optimization rule of thumb is, if a person can't see it, search engines don't care about it. This includes depreciated meta tags and hidden keywords. This is the source code of your site. Well, not your site, that'd be pretty impressive, but of the site we just looked at. Now, this meta descriptions are content with, or the metadata is content within the content. You can only see it by looking at the source code. And remember what we know about search engines. They're trying to match relevant results for people. So if it's not content a person would typically look at, a search engine's not typically going to use it as a ranking factor. Originally, the first meta tag we're looking at, the meta name keywords and all that content that follows, that was originally designed for search engines to help kind of categorize web pages. Because it's so easy to put in there, a lot of websites started misusing it. It was one of the early black hat or evil SEO things. And as such, search engines just said, you know what? We're not counting this anymore. Keywords no longer help you rank better, but they don't count against you. And in certain scenarios and in certain ways, they can actually be a really nice thing to have. There are some search engines or search services, I guess would be better, that aren't widely used, that are more niche, that they might actually use the keywords still. Um, and it's a great exercise to have the keywords picked out for the content you want to rank well in and include them in the source code, not because it's going to help you rank better, but because it might help you mentally keep your content on track. If there's a keyword in your list that you haven't found a use for in your content yet, you're probably not going to rank it all for that keyword. The second is the meta name description. This is the last part of that keyword tag we're looking at, of this meta tag we're looking at, and the content is ski and H, uh, daily lift ticket deals at New Hampshire ski areas. This is very important to have. Which is a weird thing to say because it actually doesn't matter at all for search ranking. A great description won't gain you an extra slot on the search results, but it will, under certain circumstances, show up on the search result. So as we're looking at here, in the search engine results pages, and this is from Google, it's actually using the description we've given it rather than content from the own page, from its, from the page. Typically, a search engine is going to want to use content from within the page. Google, under certain circumstances, and Bing, under even a wider variety of circumstances, will use this description tag. Um, so don't think of it in terms of ranking, but it does help with the click-through. You'll also notice, and this was a search for Ski and H deals, that the words Ski, New Hampshire, and deals have all been put in bold. So when I'm searching and I'm going through my search results, they're nice and bold, and as such, I'm more likely to click on them. So it's not search engine optimization in the sense of ranking higher, but it is search engine optimization in the sense of making more of your placement in search results. The next is hidden keywords. Back in the late 90s and even a little bit in the early 2000s, this was the bread and butter of a lot of the sneakier ways of ranking higher. This was a search engine optimization trick, and it's still used way too often. Now, this is keyword stuffing or, or whatever, but it's a list of keywords that is not only complete and other nonsense as a paragraph, reading this, it makes absolutely no sense, but this is on the page itself. We've gone a step further and we've actually hidden it by putting it in a box of the same color. So the, the content itself is still there, but there's no way a user would see it. This is very, very bad. This will get you knocked down in rankings. In fact, if you rank number one and you do this, it might take you down to two or three or four. This is right from Google's playbook, trying to deceive our web crawler by means of hidden text, deceptive cloaking, or doorway pages, compromise the quality of their results, and degrades the search experience for everyone. We think it's a bad thing.
And that's a really good hint not to do it is that Google saying, "Uh uh-uh. But read into this a little bit more. The reason it's bad is because it degrades the search experience. And that's true for anything that degrades the search experience. Google and Bing are going to think it's bad because you're hurting their product quality. So anything that's a trick will likely be short-lived, which is why we operate instead off of these nice principles, these rules of thumb, these you can't go too far astray following this mantra. But what if we're not trying to be sneaky about it? What if we take these keywords and put them right out in the open as part of the content of our website, part of the content of our web page? And you see this all the time, or at least you used to more, um, where you would see just a list of keywords shoved somewhere into the footer or shoved somewhere in the content. And we call this keyword stuffing. And it's also kind of a bad thing which goes against everything that we used to think about search engines. We'd say, this is more keywords, and if you don't use the keywords, then you can't rank for the keywords, so this is your opportunity to use them, but you're using them without any context, without any content. And you as a user looking at a paragraph, and I use the term use loosely, looking at a paragraph like what you're looking at right here, um, you're likely to think that this is complete and other bull. And search engines have been trained to kind of look at it like you because if you got results consistently that you thought were kind of eh, not quite relevant because they use tricks like this, you would switch to another search engine. So search engines want to match you with relevancy. Ergo, this kind of trick is very bad. How bad? Well, remember that last quote about affecting search engine quality? That bad. Which brings us to our next on-site search engine optimization rule of thumb. If a person thinks it's horseradish, search engines will likely agree. Now, what do we mean by this? We mean that stuffing or overstuffing keywords and keyword spamming are bad. Duplicate content or the practice of what we call spun content, which is taking a paragraph and making it slightly different for the sake of having more, quote, relevant content, or doorway pages and redirect farms, which is setting up an experience that's different for Google as it would be for a normal search user, and cloaking content, which we had already seen. All of these things are stuff that if a person saw you doing it, that user would know right away that you are kind of pulling something on them. Search engines don't want users to have that kind of experience because it makes the search engine look bad. They will actually punish you for this kind of practice. Search engines will deduct and ban for poor practice and they do it all the time. Search engine um, websites every day get a red flag from Google or Bing or similar. And because of these deductions or bans, these websites trying these little tricks, tricks that once were the way to go, or because they hadn't updated their site with one of the 600 changes that came that year that made that trick no longer work, these pages now experience significantly lower ranking on their top keywords. Or complete removal from the search engine results altogether and relisting and recovery of your prior ranking might not always be possible. So having looked at what works and what doesn't work and a few ways to get yourself in trouble, I thought before we move on, it might be nice to go over a quick search engine optimization cheat sheet, the kind of boiled down version of everything we've just learned in a way that you can take out your pen and paper now and take some quick notes. And if I go too fast, you've got a pause button. That's what's great about on demand. First, domains and subdomains, the, they do matter. If you have the choice of being a .gov and a .com, then the .gov tends to rank a little bit higher, and this is, of course, based on correlative research. Uh, Google will never tell. Um, but what we do know, based on the correlation of the sites that are out there and the sites that rank, is that some of the dot, uh, the exotic domains like .cc and .ws, uh, these tend to not rank so well. And the thought process behind that is that um, these exotic domains have been overused by uh, ad-based keyword spammers for so long that after a while, just like the keyword tag and just like uh, keyword spamming, uh, search engines got smart and started saying, well, if you're keyword.com versus keyword.ws, which one of these is probably more relevant to keyword? and keyword.com tends to win. 
Also, if your domain can be keyword targeted, like in the case of skiing in, a- skiing in New Hampshire, skiinh.com, um, that's much better than being overly creative, like granitestate2planks.com. This is a battle that marketing might have with search engine optimization in terms of what's going to get more traffic, but if organic search results is what you're looking for, eh, really want to be as close to the search keywords as possible. The same is for the, the tourism in New Hampshire website. Visitnh.gov is is probably a better fit than I break for brown leaves.com. Now, if you've ever visited New Hampshire, you know, both would probably be pretty applicable. Um, but visiting H.com is more likely to be searched for and search engines tend to not understand, um, the idiosyncrasies of these horrible, horrible puns. Shorter is also better. If you can help it, try to go for no more than 15 characters in your domain, your main.com, silvertech.com, for example, um, or your site.com. Uh, avoid hyphens. Like the exotic domains, hyphens tend to be overused by keyword spammers, and as such, um, search engines seem to have gotten wiser, and um, websites using hyphens seem to be ranking a little lower than their unhyphenated competition. And also, subfolders are better than subdomains. And this is getting a little geeky, but a subdomain would be blog.mysite.com, whereas a... Uh, a folder would be mysite.com slash blog. Now, both are great ways to get keywords in, but what happens is when you have so many subdomains, they tend to stack. So if you have blog.mysite and shoes.mysite and dresses.mysite and oranges and apples.mysite, um, after a while, search engines will stop treating these subdomains like a greater part of your site and more like individual sites. So you find yourself trying to build up multiple silos at once, whereas if you had just used a folder, like mysite.com slash blog slash whatever, the search engines will see it as one continuous site. Also want to take a look at the file name. And this goes back to what we were just talking about with the subfolders. Descriptive and keyword relevant will always be the way to go. So, skinh.com slash deals, part of the reason that did so well was because, in searching for Ski New Hampshire deals, was because, well, look at the URL. It's Ski New Hampshire deals. And a search engine and a human would both see that as a pretty good hint. You also want to be URL-friendly formatting. So, no underscores, spaces, or special characters. Even though some servers will let you have a space or a special character in there or an underscore for sure, um, you want to avoid it if at all possible because search engines will get a little... And people look at that as pretty wonky. Hyphens are okay. I know I just said they're not. As a domain, they're overused. But if you need to use hyphens to make it a little bit more readable for people... And we've seen what happens when you don't put spaces between certain words, and that's a lot of humor sometimes. Um, it's good to put hyphens. It's okay to put hyphens in your URLs and in your longer links. Um, and dynamic URLs, and this is really common with uh, e-commerce platforms, those need to be um, search engine optimized as well. So store.mysite.com slash store.php, aside from being on PHP, um, product is equal to 3,000. Product number 3,000 means as much to me as a user as it does to Google. I have no idea what product 3000 is. I can't read barcodes either. But um, slash small appliances slash coffee makers, ah, now I know what this content might be about. And if it works on a human, remember, search engines probably dig it too. There's also this part, the title of your web page, the descriptive keyword targeted title of your web page. There's no reason to repeat the title of your web page on other pages. There's not. You don't have the same content on multiple pages. Why would you have the same title for multiple pages? Your title should always be unique. It's okay to have the same structure. If it's always description or descriptive keyword set hyphen your brand, that's fine. But don't make your titles compete with each other for search ranking within your own page. The most important keywords and phrases, if you're going long tail, should always be earlier on and as early on in your web in your web page's title as possible, site wide, and keep it 70 characters or less. Yes, Google and Bing will index something longer, but a user won't ever see it. 
In fact, in modern browsers, the users really only get to see the top 20 characters because it's such a small little browser window that we have for titles. In search engine result pages, we'll only see the first 70 before it starts getting truncated. So remember the human factors. Be human friendly for not only visibility, but for compelling web searchers. Um, make the title not a list of keywords, but something compelling to click on. This is still the headline of your article. This is still what users are going to see when they're searching for your content, and it's still super important that people are uh, motivated to click on it. This is some great data, and this is from seomoz.org, and I have to give them a shout out because they do some amazingly detailed levels of research in terms of what's working right now on specifically Google. Um, and so what we're seeing here is the, um, the importance of query, um, in the title, meaning where the, not only is the keyword in the title, um, over thousands and thousands of searches and thousands and thousands of keywords, but how early on in the title is it? So we see the highest point, the most weight of a search is if the keyword somebody searched for is the first word of the title. And it goes all the way down to if it's the tenth word of the title, it's almost like it's, why even bother? There's also the content, the copy. We talked about this earlier on, that you need to use the desired keywords and their synonyms in the content. And I have a quick hint on how to figure out what the right keywords are. Also remember that the formatting matters. If it's bold or what your web guys will call strong, and the use of headers to really describe to a user and to search engines, both, what this content is about so it can get a good idea what your site is about. The internal links using descriptive anchor tags and cross-linking to your own content will help you know more. You can read more about it at internallinkingforseo.com. I know that's incredibly cool. This is a YouTube video and you can't actually click that. But that's a really good example if this was a web page. And images need to have the alt. Not only would it help with people who are visually impaired coming to your site, but it'll help the visually impaired search engine robots also know what your content is about. So taking a look at this page again, knowing everything we know about search engine optimization and everything we know about being human and reading content, what is this page about? And I hope looking at this and looking at your own content, you have a new appreciation of what it went into in terms of how you see it and how search engine sees it. And I want to take a quick mental break right for a second uh, and talk about the keywords themselves and a nice tool to find which keywords are best for you. If you've ever bought ad space with Google and the Google pay-per-click system, you're very familiar with this. This is the Google AdWords keyword tool. And what happens is you type in the keyword that you're thinking about and Google AdWords system will come back and say, ah, well, there's also people searching for this list of 1,000 related keywords. And it will tell you what the going rate is and what the competition is on these 1,000 related keywords. And you can give it a whole list of keywords that you want to rank well and it will give you related keywords. So if you have a rough idea of what your site is about, this tool will help you identify the most searched for keywords, the most competitive keywords. And what you'll learn over time is maybe you don't go for that most searched for keyword because there's so much competition on it that you might stand a better chance going for a keyword that's a little less searched for with a lot less competition. And you can find this, the ironically, the easiest way to find this tool is to Google AdWords keyword tool. In fact, typing it in is nearly impossible. And so everything we've just talked about is what we call uh, on-site signals. This is the stuff that you as a webmaster have a lot of control over that tells both users and search engines what your web page and what your website is all about. And that's the title of the web page, the content, the formatting, the internal links, the domain, the file name, the images, the diagrams, all of that stuff that matters. But there's something else. All that on-page stuff is a bit like, and think about it as a networking event. I love the internet as a networking event because it works a little like this. All the on-page signals was that one guy standing in the corner of a networking event saying, I happen to be the best at, well, I'll use search engine optimization because there's always one of those at every marketing event. Um, and so 
The on-page signals is everything that this person is telling you that they know about search engine optimization. And so that helps you as a user or uh, somebody in the room figure out, oh, that's what you're about. You're about SEO. Off-page signals are your ability to go to the other people in that room and say, hey, does this guy really know what he's talking about? Is this guy a trusted resource? Off-page signals matter as much, if not more, in search engine optimization than they do at any networking event. And these on-page signals include inbound links in terms of their context, their content, their quality, and their quantity. Are people linking to you? Are people talking about you? Are the links relevant? A link to says click here isn't as relevant as a link that says SEO, for example. And we know that from our on-page stuff. Advanced search products can also help you quite a bit uh, in terms of being visible. For example, Google products and um, Google places will help you be more, more visible. Reviews and social media signals, especially where search has become so personal that my search results will be different from your search results. The social media signals from my network will help a site rank higher if it's from somebody within my network that's kind of given the site a little bit of an extra share or a, a plus. Your host neighborhood matters quite a bit as well. If you're hosted by the same server that has a lot of these uh, sneaky sites that we've been talking about earlier, these sites that try to trick Google into higher rankings, if you come from one of these bad neighborhoods, that'll affect your ability to rank well in search. Content uniqueness also matters. If you have the same content word for word as somebody else, not only are you being a little sneaky, but it's not going to help you at all. In fact, it could hurt you. Geographic location matters enormously, especially for um, geography-specific searches like pizza. If I'm searching for pizza, the relevant content is going to be pizza places near me. So I'm like more likely to see local pizzerias than I am uh, a pizza in California if I'm searching from Manchester, New Hampshire. How much do these off-page site off-page signals matter? Quite a bit. In fact, more than half. Everything we've talked about in terms of on-page and collectively in terms of on-site signals um, don't make up nearly as much as these off-site signals. And a lot of these on-site signals here um, include things like, you know, domain age, um, stuff that we haven't even talked about because you don't have control over it. These off-site signals matter even more, the most important of which tends to be those inbound links. Knowing the importance of inbound links, there's a lot of services out there to buy links. Remember what Google said earlier about anything that can negatively affect search results? All right. Now, while your site may actually be relevant to the search query, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to cheat it by buying links. As such, bought links are universally a pretty bad thing. JC Penny, and I can't blame JC Penny. When I talk about JC Penny in this case, I'm talking about their search engine optimization company at the time, which is no longer uh, somebody they work with. Said, okay, search engine optimization matters, inbound links matter. I'm going to go ahead and buy JC Penny all the links they could possibly want. And what happened is one day, jcpenny.com earned a ton of highly descriptive links. Links that were like sweaters and the sweaters was underlined and the sweaters was a link and the sweaters would go to JCPenney's website, not necessarily to sweaters. But these thousands and thousands of inbound links that came so quickly that it was cause for some concern came from sites that didn't really make sense. A site in the UK about landscaping had absolutely no business talking about a sweater. And in fact, if you look at this site, it's nothing but links and spun content. With these thousands and thousands and thousands of links, they did manage to achieve the number one slot on search terms that were highly competitive at the time, like, for example, sweaters. But what happened is, because of the scenario under which it happened, there was too much velocity. The links came from strange sources. Um, their victory was short-lived. In fact, within an hour or so, they started dropping rank. The link scheme would be exposed later by the New York Times, at which point Google would admit um, that it had 
flag something on their system to the point where manual action was also taken. And in fact, they were lucky not to get blacklisted. They did get red flagged. And what that meant was over time, not only did JCPenney um, not rank number one for the slots they had paid so much money for, but they started to rank even lower in some cases than they had started. Something like that can be nearly impossible for a site to come out of. In fact, more often than not, this kind of practice can get you blacklisted, which means even if I search for you by name, I won't see you in a search result. So there are some good ways to build links. And a lot of these come from a school of thought called inbound marketing. And Google it. There's some great books out there. Blog content for your site is wonderful. Having a blog, if you can pull it off, is fantastic because it lets you get some good quality keywords, some good quality content, and if it's good enough to be shared, people will often share it. And there's a great book about this whole science. It's called Content Rules. Grab it. Blog content for other sites. The art of actually helping another site out can help you quite a bit. So if there's an industry site that you have an opportunity to write for, think of it in the same way as writing for one of the industry magazines. Writing for that magazine gives you a little bit of clout. Writing your content for a website that has a lot of clout gives you the ability to put a link within the blog post that you've written for this other site. And that link come back comes back to you, so you get all the link love from this other site. And if you do it right, even a little bit of their traffic. Blogger outreach and promotions are huge for B2C. This is where you see a review on um, somebody's personal blog or, or a particular review blog for a product. Typically, this is something that your PR firm or your full-service digital marketing agency will help you out with, connecting your products with the people who might be willing to write about your products. And blog contents for other sites referencing your content or what we call link bait. Offer something that is so special, it has to be shared. A lot of times, these are infographics are huge, and people will write about infographics like crazy, um, or just really useful online tools, often calculators, and things like that, that are pretty easy to develop. News and press releases can help quite a bit as well. Uh, most press release uh, distribution platforms will allow you to put one, two links, and you can control the content of those links. So if Silver Tech wants to rank a little higher for search engine optimization, I might put out a press release about this thing being available to everybody who might want it, and I will make sure search engine optimization is a link that comes back to our search engine optimization page. That will help my site rank better by getting the vote from whoever picks up this content under the right scenarios. You can also ask for a link by offering link guidance. Just have a section of your site that tells people, hey, if you want to link to us, here's kind of the proper way. Or here's a special badge you can put on your site that'll uh, show your support for our cause. This is great for nonprofits. Now, it's a lot of work to get a link. You could buy them, but then you'd be in these guys' shoes. So, Never let this work go to waste. If you do change your site or you do change your content and some content is going to go away, use what's called a 301 or a 401 redirect. And what this will do is this will tell search engines, hey, um, the content's still there. This link that you found is technically still good. Um, just the content's moved over here. And this kind of redirect will let you keep the clout that comes from that site. Whereas if you broke the link, that link would no longer count. Now, if you are going to be writing as part of your link building strategy, whether it's to get links from your site for writing fantastic content or to write uh, search engine optimized content for somebody else, there's a great online resource called InboundWriter.com. They have no idea I'm doing this. I hope they don't mind. I'm sure they won't. Um, InboundWriter.com is free for up to nine articles a month. And then if that's like 20 bucks and it's perfect for blogging. As you can see here, you just throw in your content, a couple of keywords you want to rank for, and it'll give you these handy little tips and, and, and charts and stuff like that that says, hey, um, Mark, you wanted to rank really high for digital marketing agency, um, but you've only managed to use it once in this entire article. You might want to look for an excuse to use it again. So it'll give you live suggestions and feedback just like an editor. That being said, it always helps to have an editor. 
Now there's also outbound placement building techniques. This is outbound search marketing. This is often uh, stuff you'll end up paying for one way or another. Um, one great example, this one's actually free, is um, Google Place pages or Bing Places or Bing Locations. Um, any opportunity to officially register your website and your business with a search engine should never be passed up. In this case, you it's great for if you're a local business especially because it'll also take all your reviews and everything else and bring it into one place. In fact, if you're a local business, you probably already have a Google Place page made for you. Find it and you can claim it using your own telephone number and build it out from there with the applicable keywords and that's a whole field in itself. There's also Google and Bing Webmaster Tools and while these won't help you build your site up, they will help you troubleshoot your site map, for example, or get notified if Google and uh, Bing, depending on which webmaster tool you set you're using, if they have a hard time searching your content and indexing your content, this is kind of your alarm window for search engine. It'll also, this is useful, tell you when um, search engines are even crawling your site so that you know, okay, if I update my site now, probably won't have an effect for a next day. There's also search engine pay-per-click. This is fantastic because the sad truth is not everybody can rank in the first 10 results. In fact, that's pretty literal, right? Nobody's surprised by this. So your ability to rank in the first 10 results for every keyword you would think it works for you is pretty unlikely, and there isn't a brand in existence that can do it. So that's where pay-per-click comes in. Um, Google AdWords and Bing's pay-per-click model both offer you the ability to bid on the keywords you want most and to have your content and links show up. This is a great way to offset your growing search engine optimization efforts uh, on page and off page and to really get in there um, on some very highly competitive keywords just always making sure you keep a close eye on how much you're bidding and how much you're paying for the traffic and making sure that you're getting the right profit back because it's silly if it's not making you any money. So today we've talked about search engine optimization in terms of on-page signals like keyword use and URL structure and off-page use, like off-page signals like inbound links and user location. I've shared a few of my favorite tools like the keyword tool and your keyword writing tool, Inbound Writer. Uh, we've also discussed some of the best practices in terms of how you can set up your web page and your website um, and some of the worst practices like buying links. Now it's your turn. We'll answer your questions online. Just ask us on Twitter at SilverTech and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash SilverTech. You can also take a look at our blog at blog.silvertech.com and sign up for our monthly marketing insights so that you never miss out on the content we generate. And more importantly, thank you for your time and we hope this finds you well.